I'm Andrew Holland, Executive Director of the Fusion Industry Association. What follows is a conversation I had with Alex Hackbarth, the Director of Climate and Energy Security at the American Security Project. As well as being Director of the FIA, I'm also Chief Operating Officer of ASP, a national security think tank that focuses on long-term challenges and opportunities. Alex and I had a long conversation about how fusion energy is linked to national security and why it's important. This conversation was originally originally published on ASP's Flashpoint podcast, but I thought it would be interesting for Fusion viewers to see it on our YouTube channel as well. I enjoyed the conversation, and I hope you do too. And now, on to our discussion. Andrew, welcome to the Flashpoint podcast. You're normally the host of Flashpoint, but today you're in the hot seat, so to speak. That's right. We've been rotating around and everything in quarantine, so this works. Yeah. So in addition to your role as the Chief Operating Officer for the American Security Project, you're also the Director of the Fusion Industry Association. So needless to say, you've got a lot of experience in the energy space. So I'm glad I get a chance to talk to you today about alternative clean energy. Yeah. So let, yeah, let's jump right in. Um, oil and reduced carbon emissions have been in the news a lot lately. Uh, demand for oil was down before coronavirus, mm -hmm. but demand dropped even further because of travel restrictions and the shuttering of factories. Combine that with the price war that Russia and Saudi Arabia started earlier this year and the ASPs reported on, uh, there's now an oversupply of oil. And the glut in the oil market, as we saw earlier this week, caused prices to go negative. Um, yeah. And the price for June delivery of oil is plummeting as well. Yeah. So the volatility in the oil market, you know, I think highlights uh, a major vulnerability and, you know, ASP and others have argued that it's a reason to develop alternative energy sources. Um, and many argue, again, including ASP, that the dramatic drop in carbon emissions um, is an opportunity worth seizing. Carbon, uh, China's carbon emissions dropped 25% in the first quarter of this year, and we've seen cleaner skies all over the globe. Um, right. Here in the U.S. even, L.A., New York, and D.C., I saw an article the other day that has some of the cleanest air it's had in decades. Mm -hmm. So it seems ripe, uh, you know, that the time is ripe to invest in and develop alternative energy sources that are less volatile and clean in an effort to fight climate change. So I guess my first question, given your experience, what are some of the compelling reasons in your view for alternative energy development? And are there any particular technologies you think show you know, great promise? Yeah, so, so I think this, this is an important point to start. First principles, right? Why do we want alternative energy? Why do we want clean energy? Uh, and at its base, fossil fuels, oil especially, is a fantastic fuel. It is an energy dense liquid fuel. So what that means is that you've got a lot of energy in an easily transported and easily burned liquid. So it's easy to take it around. It's easy to load it on a plane and then burn it going out the back of the plane to make you go fast and go a long way. Uh, it is fossil fuels and especially oil are just incredibly convenient. Uh, and that's important. Now, if there was no externalities, then that would be even better. The problem is there are externalities. And so externalities is an economic term that means things that aren't included in the price, things that harm outsiders that aren't included in the price. And so the externalities of oil uh, include those carbon emissions you talked about, the pollution, so SOx, NOx, mercury, other sorts of particulate pollution that goes into the air. These are the things that, you know, smog, smoke, things that go into your lungs and are harmful. Carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, is not harmful to humans in, uh, when they breathe it. Uh, carbon dioxide is harmful because of the uh, impact it has on climate change. It makes the earth warmer. Uh, and that is probably the biggest um, unpriced externality is the, the impacts of climate change, the impacts that, cli that climate change is having on security, stability, economic growth, everything around the world. So 
oil is, uh, depending on which country you're in, uh, either the first or second contributor to uh, climate change. Coal is, is usually the other one. Uh, and, and industrial processes, you know, making concrete, all that sort of stuff. But they, you burn coal, you burn, burn oil to do those things. So uh, because we depend on burning oil, burning gasoline to drive our cars, that means that we, uh, you know, we are causing um, climate pollution, climate, uh, and, and that's, that's harmful. So we need alternatives. Uh, luckily, we are developing alternatives, have developed alternatives. Solar and wind power uh, are growing extraordinarily fast in the United States and around the world. Uh, in uh, the U.S., just last week, uh, so this middle, middle of April uh, of 2020, it, there was more uh, wind power used in the United States than coal power for the first time, uh, electricity power. Uh, that's quite something and uh, quite, quite an impressive thing. Now, uh, when we get to uh, when we get to an electricity grid that is run on solar and wind, the problem with those is that they're what you call variable. They they're not a firm source of electricity. Uh, the sun, you know, solar power works on when the sun shines. Wind power works when the wind blows. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and, and that doesn't always match up with. Uh, when people want to use power, when po people need power. So you need a firm source of power as well. And so the way the grids work right now, that's usually natural gas, could be coal, could be nuclear power. Um, but we think uh, that basically every, sor every source of, of electricity, of energy, has these externalities, has these problems. So let's, let's look for one that doesn't. Uh, you mentioned Fusion Industry Association. Uh, fusion power has no externalities. No, it has, has very few externalities. Uh, it will be clean, safe, sustainable, secure, um, economically uh, competitive, all these sorts of things. <laughs> the, the problem is we don't have it yet. Right. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's one of the great scientific challenges of the 21st century. Uh, and, and it's really going to be transformative when we get there. Uh, fusion is literally the opposite of fission. A lot of times people say it's, you know, oh, it's, it's another nuclear power. And, and that's true, uh, but it is literally the opposite. Whereas where fission splits the atom and gets the, the energy that comes out of that, fusion uh, fuses atoms, uh, usually two hydrogen atoms, forces them together at high pressures and densities, uh, and they fuse together to form uh, helium, uh, and then release a tremendous amount of energy as they do it. It's, it's Einstein's formula, E equals mc squared, where, where E is energy is equal to mass times the constant squared. So there's a tremendous amount of energy locked up within uh, the within the nucleus of, of an atom uh, and that nuclear reaction releases some of that energy uh, it's it, it is tremendously powerful um, we we do fusion experiments all the time around the world uh, we have we've done it since the 1950s uh, and we've, we've done these experiments that the challenge is is that it takes more energy to contain the reaction, to initiate and to contain the reaction than it does, than the energy it gives off. So, uh, so we are, at this point, it's, it's still, it's a scientific and engineering challenge. It's not, not yet a, a commercial power uh, source. Interesting. So you mentioned, um, some of the problems with some of the renewables being, you know, the so you know, when the sun's up, you get solar energy, but when the sun's down, you don't get solar energy. Same thing with wind, when the wind's not blowing. And so, as you mentioned, that baseload power right now, a lot of it's coming from natural gas or nuclear. Is there a, 
do you see an opportunity for fusion? I mean, is that where this would be a complement to some of these other renewables, or is this something that could take the entire over the entire electrical um, capacity or needs of the the U.S.? Yeah, uh, it's both. Uh, at this point, uh, though, coming into the electrical grid, grid now, coming into an electrical grid in the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s, uh, we hope that that's a, an electrical grid with steadily increasing volumes of renewable power on it. We need it to be. Um, to meet uh, American Paris climate targets, to meet uh, American, just, just the targets for, for global climate emissions, we need more renewable power going into the American grid. Um, if we could get it to, at this point, uh, I forget the exact numbers, if you, if you include hydropower, um, which is a firm source but is renewable, I think it's like 8% of electricity and it fluctuates day to day, obviously. Um, but if you can start getting it up into the 10, 20, 30, 40% range, um, it becomes a very substantial and important part of the energy system. Um, there's certain states where they, they are getting to that point, and there's certain countries like Germany where it's getting to that point on, on certain, you know, sunny and windy days. Um, the thing is, is that when you get up to that level, it starts playing a, a bit of havoc with the energy grid. Uh, and, and so it becomes more unstable, it becomes more difficult to, to make sure that the lights stay on, to make sure that, that there is enough um, backup power on the grid. It just, and it, it just becomes much more expensive to do it. So, uh, you know, renewable power is extremely important, but it, it does prevent, present some really <laughs> challenging economic problems mm -hmm. to power providers and to, to the country. Uh, so that's where having a clean, firm source of power comes in. Nuclear power can, can do that. Um, it has some, some very strong economic problems mm -hmm. uh, that, that they have to work on. Uh, so that's where these fusion power uh, options come in, is to, to be able to come in, be a complement to the existing renewables under the grid, uh, and to find a way to, to be that zero carbon, always available uh, economic source of power. So, so that, for that reason, a number of companies have started up. Fusion has been, has been a government-run science experiment for decades, uh, and uh, they've, they've achieved a lot and gone a long way. The new thing is that this is now private companies working on it as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just a government-run experiment. It's not just the Department of Energy funding uh, Princeton and University of Wisconsin and you know the the various other uh, MIT, various other uh, you know public sector entities to do research. Uh, this is now something that is a, a, a private companies with investor dollars are taking some of the important research being done and push that out there, uh, and and make some very significant breakthroughs and, and uh, get some very significant money in there. Yeah, so I have a question about the, the technology breakthroughs. You know, you often hear fusion energy always seems to be 10 years away. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's so close, but we're 10 years out. We're 10 years out and it's been that way for a while, it seems. So why do you think fusion is feasible now? And what are some of the recent technological developments as you just alluded to that make it more feasible now? Yeah, so uh, fusion is, uh, you know, it's basically, you look around at the, the technology advances everywhere. Uh, so material science, uh, uh, you know, AI and computing power and um, advances in even just business practices. So, so we'll start, though, with materials uh, science. Uh, one of the most important things, so there, there's, a big, there's a big fusion reactor being built in the south of France called ITER. It's, mm -hmm. a, uh, it's an international consortium. U.S. is a partner to it. It's going to cost somewhere in the range of $30 billion by the time it's done. Um, but it was designed, the, the design 
was was basically a 1990s design. So so more than 20 year old design, um, and it's it's huge. It's literally three times as much steel in it as is in the Eiffel Tower. Wow. So it's, <laughs> it's a That's huge a lot thing. of steel. <laughs> it's a lot of steel. You know, and, and I mean, just just that alone uh, makes it a it, it, never mind the technology or anything like that. Just that that volume alone makes it sort of a, an economic dead end. It's just too expensive to to build a power plant uh, that has that much steel, that much stuff in it, concrete, all of that sort of stuff. It it it, it doesn't go doesn't become a power plant. Um, it, it's, it's an important scientific experiment and, and it will, will meet some milestones when it, it gets turned on and built. Um, but there, a, a big change happened about 10 years ago is some researchers who, who were working on, on the, the eater design and, and others like it said, there, wait, there's this new thing called high temperature superconducting wire and that high HTS wire. Uh, if you wrap it tight, we could make magnets that are much, much more powerful than existing magnets, magnets the magnet that the eater will be, be built with. So these HTS magnets uh, enable you to build a much smaller machine that is capable of the same amount of power. So making it smaller means that you can build it faster. You can iterate faster. You can be more nimble, and it's a lot cheaper. So, so there's a couple of companies that are are working in that that way. There's other things uh, that are like uh, that companies picked up uh, technologies that were left behind by a um, by the, the Department of Energy or other government research programs around the world. Uh, so there's, there's one company called General Fusion based up in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, and theirs is, is really interesting design. It's basic, it takes a, a lead lithium blanket uh, and swirls it really fast. And, and then it takes these giant pistons and it slams them down all together at once on the lead lithium blanket and within the, the lead lithium, there's a, a void in which they shoot a plasma. And then the collapsing lead crushes the plasma and they'll create fusion within there. Huh. Uh, so it's, it's like a big fusion engine, almost like a diesel engine, right? That instead of, instead of putting uh, fuel inside of there, you, you put in you know, a, a uh, magnetized plasma it's collapsed and, and fusion happens inside of there. Uh, so the, the thing that the, the new technology there is actually, it's, it's a 1970s design that was uh, put together, that was started by the Naval Research Laboratory, but then it was cut by the Department of Energy because there was other more promising ways forward, the kind of the eater pathway, the tokamak pathway is what we call it. And so, because it was left behind, this company uh, just said, hey, wait, this, this could be a, a way forward. Let's pick it up off of the cutting room floor, do some research, do some stuff, start building things, see if we can raise some money. And now here they are, and it's, I think, 17, 18 years later, uh, they've built some machines, they've raised a lot of money, uh, and are in the process of figuring out where the next, next uh, experiment is going to be, and they've they've showed a lot of results. Um, you know, they, there's other ones, other similar stories like that as well with with some of these other companies. Uh, it's basically that that fusion had been narrowed down into one pathway, the eater pathway, and then there's another pathway that that is used to test uh, nuclear weapons, uh, and uh, so that's the the laser pathway. But it turns out there's all these other options out there as well. So, so that sort of stuff. And then you combine that with the, the great technology break breakthroughs everywhere else. Uh, you know, uh, artificial intelligence enables you to uh, you know, take the test results you learn, learn about and, and iterate faster, build faster. Um, 
you know, uh, 3D printing, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. it, it's taking technology designs that are help, helping things out elsewhere mm -hmm. and, and helping grow, grow it faster and get there faster. So it seems like, you know, there's been a lot of technological advancement, both in, you know, just generally the energy space, but also, mm -hmm. you know, or just technological space, I guess, mm -hmm. like you mentioned AI, but also mm -hmm. specific to fusion, yeah. but it also seems like it's still very expensive. And, you know, that's a big risk for private companies to mm -hmm. take on on their own. So I understand that the Department of Energy recently published a request uh, for information or an RFI asking for input from the fusion industry on how best to design a cost sharing program for fusion reactor technologies. So has the government used, you know, public private partnerships like this before? And what does that mean? What does this development mean for the fusion industry? Yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, it, it's really exciting time. This, they, they are uh, talking about designing a cost share program. So, so the idea is that the, the government would cover 50% of the costs um, or, or something like that. It still hasn't been designed yet. Right, right. Uh, but but what, what we've talked about and what we're looking at is a 50% cost share. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea is, is that this would, uh, this is in the US government's national interest to have a fusion industry here in the United States. It's important for our national security um, because energy at its base is a security, uh, security issue. It's, it's something that, that we want to have this here. It's, it's important for our competitiveness, our economic competitiveness. We want the new industries of the future to be American industries. Uh, we don't want our competitors, the Chinese, the you know, Europeans, Koreans, Japanese, to, to develop a new industry here, and then we have to buy it from, uh, develop new industry over there, and then we have to buy it from them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's a real danger that that, that could happen. Uh, these these companies are are global, and it's it, it is global investment that they've got. So uh, they're going to go to where it's uh, you know most attractive. Uh, so so we it, it's it's in our interest to to build these here. So that's why uh, the U.S. government has said. Yeah, you know, it, it could be important to do a cost share thing with you. Um, they have started a new public-private partnership within the last um, year or so. They started a, a small voucher program called the Infuse program. Uh, and that, that pays private companies, allows private companies to pay um, national labs to do work with them and their scientists there. Uh, it's it's a really interesting and, and good program, but it's it's small dollars, uh, and it's it's just kind of a it's a nice thing to have, uh, and has has resulted in some nice uh, nice research over over the last and nice partnerships uh, over the last year since it's been there. But but this public private partnership, the idea is to kind of model it, what NASA did uh, to get commercial space up and running. And so this is the, the program called COTS, Commercial Orbital Transport Services, uh, that started, uh, that got SpaceX started. Uh, so SpaceX, you know, did exist, but mostly as Elon Musk's idea that he wanted to go to the moon. Right. <laughs> or Mars or wherever. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, uh, but NASA at this time was, it says the, the shuttle program was ending. Uh, they needed a way to get astronauts to the International Space Station and to get cargo to the International Space Station without relying on Russia. So mm -hmm. a clear need for the Americans, Amer American competitiveness, clear need for the American government uh, mm -hmm. to have. Uh, and, you know, NASA was planning on building its own new orbiter uh, launch uh, rocket, but some, some folks within NASA said, and within Congress said, look, couldn't the private sector do this better, faster, and cheaper? Uh, and so they were able to start up this public-private partnership program uh, that was a 50% cost share, uh, and, they, and it's a reimbursable uh, milestone-based cost share. So right. it's, it's not just, 
here's some money, go build. Mm -hmm. It's let me sh it's, show me what you can build and then we'll validate it and then you get the money. So the government is protected. Mm -hmm. This isn't some, you know, cost plus contract where, yeah. you know, just throw it, throw in money. Some boondoggle, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, not here. <laughs> yeah, no pallets full of cash. Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is, the idea is to, uh, to protect uh, the American taxpayer, uh, but also to incentivize good work by private companies. So if the company shows that they're not able to, to meet the milestones, and these are milestones that they'll have written, they'll have mutually agreed and negotiated with the Department of Energy. Uh, if they're unable to meet that, then, then the program, and then, then their cost share ends. But the idea is, is that as they negotiate these cost shares, as they build them out, then they'll, there will be, uh, you know, They'll be able to build machines and build new things. Um, you know, there, there's other models as well. The uh, uh, small modular reactor program within Department of Energy is also a cost share program, uh, and that's going to result in in the first new nuclear small modular reactor nuclear power plants uh, being built in 2021 or so, 22 something like that. Um, so it, it, it's there are there are other models out there. Um, that that are possible and and that companies like uh, so it, it's it's exciting uh, it's interesting and uh, you know it's it's really an exciting time in the fusion community as a whole because there are these these breakthroughs happening uh, they've they've been going through this community reorganization this community planning process over the last year that's that's going to result in some very interesting reprioritization of uh, the fusion community towards building a power plant, towards building, you know, actual fusion, uh, fusion power plants. Instead of, for a long time, it's just been a science experiment. It's, this has been a science program where there's really important science being done, really learning a lot about how plasmas work and all that sort of stuff. But at this point, it's, it's time to transition from science into reality. Mm -hmm. Build something, see if you can build it, make some mistakes, go build again, you know, and, right. and get there. So you mentioned that, you know, the fusion industry is really important to our national security and our economic competitiveness, but there are lots of industries that the government doesn't partner with no. that are important to national security and our economic competitiveness. So why can't we leave this just to the private sector? And, you know, you mentioned some of the ways or some of the reasons why the government should get involved in terms of the cost sharing, but are there others that you haven't yet kind of flushed out that you... Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that that one of the most persuasive reasons why the, the government should get involved here is that if if we don't, if the U.S. doesn't, our competitors will. And by that, I mean China. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, China has kind of come out of nowhere in the last decade in fusion research. Uh, they now have uh, better publicly owned machines than, than the United States does. Wow. Their, their East tokamak is a super, superconducting tokamak that's, um, that's better and more capable than anything we have in the United States. Wow. Uh, it is, you know, everybody will tell you that uh, American scientists are better, uh, and that's probably true, that is true. Uh, it's, but if you have a better machine, uh, you know, with scientists being trained on it, uh, spending, they spend in their budget about the same uh, that the United States spends in its budget on, science, on fusion scientific research. Uh, so, you know, it, they're going to catch up. And since they have newer and, and better machines, they're, they're going to catch up. They have a plan. Uh, they are also a part of the ITER consortium. They have a plan to go to a demonstration reactor based off of the ITER design. Uh, and they also actually have some private companies starting up as well. Um, they have a big company called ENN. It's actually, it's an LNG company. Uh, and they, they bring in a lot of, lot of LNG from, from the United States and elsewhere mm -hmm. to build the terminals. 
um, apparently their CEO got seized by the idea of fusion. Uh, he has a lot of money. Uh, and so out of nowhere, he's created a kind of alternatives fusion program, private fusion program that's, that's hired huge amounts of people, 80, 100 people, which doesn't sound a lot, like a lot, but 80 or 100 plasma physicists is a large portion of, of the world's plasma physics. A lot of brain power. <laughs> so, so, so they're coming. Uh, and, and if we don't do it, then, you know, the, yeah, then, then we could see that happen. You know, we, we did see it uh, in, uh, you know, this is a little different, but in, in the advanced nuclear, advanced fission space, uh, Terra Power is a, a company based out in, uh, uh, Washington, backed by by Bill Gates and and, and a number of others, uh, and because of a lot of regulatory issues and everything here in the United States, they ended up uh, saying, "Right, we're just going to go build it in China. Uh, we don't want that to happen uh, with this." Uh, and and I do worry about that. I also worry about it uh, that we'd lose out to our allies here as well. That's not as big a deal as the Chinese getting there first. Um, but I was over in the UK uh, at the beginning of March, uh, and I toured through the UK e a a a e UK EAA um, Atomic Energy Agency mm -hmm. uh, uh, through their their uh, fusion uh, uh, facilities in in Cullum, uh, UK near Oxford. Uh, and you can tell that they want to expand. They have a, they have a government plan called STEP, Spherical Tokamak uh, Energy Producer uh, Plan to, they, to get to a uh, demonstration power plant by 2040. So they have plans. Our allies also all have plans. So it's important for the United States to get there first. Uh, you know, a, a little bit of competition among friends is good. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's sell it to them instead of them selling it to us. Yeah. So looking to the future, what's the ultimate goal here for the fusion industry? I presume you know, uh, uh, fusion industry. Sorry, what? World domination. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a clean alternative energy source um, that combats climate change, that's reliable. Um, but I mean, I'll let, I'll let you answer the yeah, question. Yeah, that, no, that's right. So, so um, fusion uh, is capable of solving the two energy related problems that, that we have. Uh, the first and most pressing is climate change. Uh, it is because it's zero carbon, produces no emissions, uh, and is safe, secure, uh, has, has, very, has no chance of a meltdown, has, has no uh, long-lived radioactive waste. It has some, some radiation that you have to deal with through tritium uh, and activated materials. You have to deal with it. Um, but it's the same as like a medical isotope facility or something like that. So, so easily regulated as well. So it, it, it scales well. It, it will be able to, uh, once you've got the, once you've got the, the commercial um, you know, demonstration, it should, we should be able to build a lot of them fast and get them out there fast. So that's the challenge is to, to deal with the climate challenge. You've got to get a huge amount of zero carbon uh, power onto the grid as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. um, the timeline, the goals are in the 2030s. So that's relevant to the climate uh, crisis. You know, under the, the Paris Agreement goals, the, the world has to reduce its emissions by 50% by 2050. Uh, and that means the developed world has to reduce them by 80% or more. Uh, and you have some, some countries saying that they, they aim to get to net zero by 2050, UK and, and others. Mm -hmm. um, so to meet those, you need this large amount of baseload power, of, of always available economic power. Fusion meets that. So, so that's number one. Number two is um, energy availability. 
uh, the, the resource scarcity problem. And, and this, is a, this is a problem that is kind of funny to talk about here in uh, April 2020 when, you know, oil is zero dollars. Um, at some point, the, the world's going to run out of oil. At some point, uh, you can't rely on fossil fuels to power your civilization. There's just not enough. Uh, so it's, this is a long-term thing, but, but there's enough power uh, in the oceans, deuterium, to power the world uh, with fusion for a couple billion years. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. Very different time horizon <laughs> than fossil exactly. fuels. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and, and without the, the um, externalities that we right. started out talking about. Uh, again, you have to, you do have to have to figure out uh, ways to regulate this, and and we're working on that too. We're working through the the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and and the IAEA on this. Um, but it's this is something that uh, with public-private partnerships, with interest from uh, investors, businesses, countries around the world. We can solve, we will get there. Uh, it's, it's, like I said, an exciting time. So is there anything that we should have discussed related to fusion since you're the expert that you know, <laughs> I didn't ask uh, about that you think uh, listeners and viewers would be interested in hearing about? Yeah, it, 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 there's another thing here too. It, it's, you know, fusion will be uh, its, its first uh, and, pro and possibly most important uh, use will be as a source of power. Um, but when you have this uh, huge baseload source, uh, you can do a lot of other things with it. Uh, it can be a, 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 a source of extreme heat. Uh, so, so you can do a lot of the industrial processes that, that require heat, so chemical processes and, and stuff like that. Um, it, you can be producing hydrogen, uh, so you could create a hydrogen fuel economy as well. Uh, you can, uh, fusion, uh, when we get there, will be an uh, important source of propulsion for rockets, if you can believe this. So it's a, a fusion rocket could get you to Mars um, more than twice as fast uh, as a chemical fuel rocket. So it, it opens up a whole lot of other um, technological age, technological things. It, 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 when we get fusion done and developed and out there, we'll, we will move into a, kind of a, a new stage of technological advancement development. We'll be able to do a lot more things uh, that otherwise we can't do. Um, it's, it, it, it's interesting and, and exciting. Uh, and then, you know, you, you talk about the money. In, in, in normal times, the U United States energy market is $1 trillion per year. So U.S. is about $14 trillion economy. Energy is about $1 trillion of that. You know, a, for something that can meet all of it or even half of it, uh, you know, that's a pretty good sized market. And, you know, the, the FIA member companies have over a billion dollars invested in them. Uh, but given the scale of the market, I think there's, uh, and, and the potential of, of the technology, I think there's a case to be made for an order of magnitude more than a, a billion dollars in there. Yeah, it seems like a great return on investment in terms of, you know, the capability of the, the technology um, versus what's there's, the investment required. That's right. The financial there, investment. That's right. There's, there, uh, there's some skepticism. Um, you know, you started out, you asked the question of 10 years away and always will be. And, and that's, um, that's nice. Usually I hear 30 years away. And <laughs> uh, so so it's, it's one of these things that, that the very smart people uh, think they know is that fusion is, is too far away and it'll never happen. Um, but they haven't updated their priors. Things, things have happened since people who learned that. Uh, and so it's time for, for folks to, to uh, realize that, that this is coming faster than they expect. That's awesome. No. So as you very well know, we ask every guest on the Flashpoint 
um, what they expect the, you know, the headlines to be in the next five to 10 years. So uh, what do you expect to be dominating the news headlines five to 10 years from now? Doesn't have to be related to fusion, but obviously can be. I'll, I'll talk fusion for this okay. one. So, uh, so there was a headline in the New York Times in December 1903 uh, that said, uh, first flight. Uh, and so that, that was the Kitty Hawk moment that uh, people had been working towards for literally a century. People had been working for a hundred years to get powered flight. Uh, and it, the design was done uh, in 1804. The basic design for an airplane was drawn up. And it took people a hundred years of work to, until the Wright brothers took off in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Um, Fusion has been worked on for 60 years. Uh, and uh, we're going to get there. Uh, I, I, I think there will be that Kitty Hawk moment, that scientific break even. Um, the trick is to move from that scientific break even point into the commercial, commercially viable um, power producer as fast as possible. You know, in 1903, they, they were flying uh, the right flyer, um, but it took a while before there was an, a market for it. It wasn't really until the, the 1920s, and there happened to be a world war in between then, uh, that advanced, advanced flight a lot. It wasn't until the 20s that, that there was really a commercial aviation market. Mm -hmm. uh, and even that was, was nascent, and, and it wasn't until the late 40s, early 50s, that it was really a, a viable thing. So, so uh, technology development and commercial development of the technology are two different things. Um, we, need, we need the commercial development of the technology to move as fast as the technology development. So I, I expect the headline will be, you know, fusion power. And then what I hope is that five years later, the headline is fusion on the grid. That would be a great scenario. And, you know, in a timeline that helps, like you said, meet some of the immediate climate challenges that we're facing in terms of reducing carbon emissions. So I think that's a great positive note to end on. Um, so thank you, Andrew, for joining me on uh, the Flashpoint. And I'm sure our listeners will be hearing from you as the regular host in the not too distant future. Thanks, Alex.